Good afternoon. Um, my name is Craig Rice. I'm one of the programmers for the film festival. Um, Minneapolis St. Paul International Film Festival is a nonprofit. Um, part of our, our survival is based on membership. So hopefully, all of you are members that are here. Um, part of my responsibility also for the festival, not just as programming, but also in creating panels. And since this is a filmmakers festival, really geared towards you know, filmmakers and helping f people get involved in filmmaking and helping filmmakers promote their films. A lot of the panels that we create here are really kind of based on that craft of making films. I think, I think, and I don't like to think this way, but it is one of the, the, the most important parts of making films is money. Um, and so, you know, like it or not, it's part of the process. Um, and so I've created a panel, this one, this, this afternoon is really about crowdfunding. Um, for our films, and there's several different aspects of crowdfunding that they're going to discuss um, in the way that I know that Dan is uh, Satorius, which is on the end here, is going to moderate this panel. Um, be engaged in this panel because this is an opportunity for you to get your questions answered and asked by people who've actually do either done it before, and there's several people who have financed their films this way, but there's also people who are engaged in the process of crowdfunding and the future process for this. I think that this is, might be the a key to the future of, of independent filmmaking um, because it isn't going to Hollywood. So this may be your last chance here if you want to make a film at some point in time in your lifetime before they close the box. So Dan Satorius, thank you for coming. Thanks, Craig. Uh, thanks, M. Smith. Uh, thanks for setting this up. Uh, we we uh, always enjoy an opportunity to uh, to talk with folks and, and share information with them. So I'm, I'm, what I'm going to do, uh, once again, I'm Dan Satorius. I'm going to introduce the panel and then just a few introductory remarks, and then we're going to open it up for the panel. As we go along, if you have questions, um, I'll be happy to take them, and, or the panel will be happy to take them. I'm going to be a, a little ruthless of, about our time because we only have a, a little about a, a little over an hour, so we want to make sure it clips along pretty fast. And if we get bogged down, I'll take over. And so I'm going to apologize to you in advance for m my uh, trail boss-like mentality. Um, so first, let me introduce uh, immediately to my left Jesse Raisler. Jesse is uh, a director, producer, cinematographer. Uh, he's an Emmy Award winning filmmaker. His work is screened internationally in venues such as South by Southwest. Uh, he has a documentary on Current TV, which I'm sure we'll talk about extensively. Uh, Jesse's approach to filmmaking uh, is best described as cinematic authenticity by fusing narrative cinematic technique with authenticity found in documentary style filmmaker. His work blurs the lines between fiction and nonfiction by capturing the truth in a conceptually thoughtful manner. Um, Jesse's uh, documentary, which we'll, I'm sure we'll talk, be talking about, is Starfish Throwers. Uh, and I've had the privilege to be part of that project. And I'm really excited about that and uh, looking forward to talking more about it. Um, Zach uh, Robbins, which is this gentleman right here, uh, is an associate uh, in the corporate and transactional practice group at Winthrop and Weinstein. Zach's extens extensive experience in the area of business and finance, mergers and acquisitions, strategic partnerships, equity raises, and debt financing provides his clients with comprehensive counsel and representation uh, when strategic growth is the focus of bi the business plans for clients. Zach uh, works closely with entrepreneurs and small businesses and is the co-founder of MinFest, which we'll talk about uh, uh, quite a bit uh, today which is a group of uh, proposing equity crowdfunding legislation that will empower growing Minnesota businesses to raise capital online from any Minnesota re resident. Um, Zach um, uh, clerked for uh, uh, US District Court uh, uh, Judge, uh, the Honorable Paul Magnuson. Uh, he got his JD from William Mitchell and a BS in Business Administration from the University of Arizona, and we're lucky to have Zach with us. Um, and then uh, Jeff, with a hand up. Um, Jeff is uh, a, a producer and uh, has a background as an independent film producer and marketing professional. Uh, he was the former chief marketing officer of the mini studio Work, Work, Works, 
uh, where he guided uh, life during wartime and Howl, uh, both great, great independent films, uh, into theatrical distribution with uh, IFC and Oscilloscope. Jeff also managed uh, festival and marketing campaigns for films at Sundance, Venice, Berlin, New York International Film Festival, Toronto, among other festivals. Jeff also brings significant brand perspective to his work in film, having developed innovative marketing programs for top brands uh, such as Jamila Target, Nike, Capital One, Lee Jeans, Thomson Reuters. Um, as a producer, he has teamed up with filmmaker uh, Shelley Ainsworth to create a series of highly regarded short films that appear nationwide on PBS, as well as in museums and festivals around the world. Uh, he's a winner of numerous FE and Ad Fed awards for effectiveness, effectiveness in advertising and creative excellence. Uh, so we're lucky to have Jeff as well. Um, I'll just give a short introduction for myself. I am a, uh, an attorney here in town. Um, I am an entertainment attorney. Before becoming an attorney, I was a producer. Having gone to film school, uh, my clients uh, are in mostly in film, television, uh, and other entertainment industries. Um, I'm on the film board, of the Minnesota Film and Television Board, which is Minnesota's, um, uh, what do you call it, uh, film commission, and uh, the pa immediate past uh, chair and president of that organization. Um, and have been around in town for many, many years and feel lucky to be working in this community. So um, just by uh, way of introdu general introduction for the topic, I want to provide a little bit of context. Um, one of the ways I think we should frame the issue of what is crowdfunding um, is that it's in a larger context of crowdsourcing, if you will, uh, which is something that's, that's been developed m recently as a result of social media online and and it, it's a, a way that the crowd, fans, uh, supporters, um, patrons can support projects. And of course, we're concerned primarily with uh, uh, film, audiovisual project, television, et cetera. And it's, it's a prior to, to the, this development this, of this phenomena, it was all very limited and we were you know, we were not really thoughtful about how we would organize the crowd because usually the crowd was our parents or friends who would help finance projects. Um, so this is a really exciting new development that's, that I think is fresh and new and is in the, fa in, in the process of being developed. And uh, so it'll be interesting to see how things evolve over the next as 10 years or so as this, this phenomena kind of comes into focus. The other context that I want to place this in uh, is that um, uh, th this is a, a donor style way of raising money. Um, and we'll talk, in fact, and Zach will help us through this as well, we'll talk more about uh, an investor style crowdfunding um, so I want to make that distinction because we'll, we'll be talking uh, more and more about that. And, and what people also often say when we're talking about crowdfunding as a way of financing film uh, projects is they say, well, you know, you can't make a film on ten or twenty thousand uh, dollars, although some people can. Um, but in this industry, in the independent film finance area, w we've never put our packages, our financing packages together on a single source. It's always been a patchwork. And uh, it's included equity, uh, which we'll talk about some more. It's included uh, uh, grants and foundation money. Uh, it's included uh, loans against uh, pre-sales, if we're so lucky. Um, and of course, soft money. So money from government, such as rebates and, and credits and that sort of stuff. So, so it, it is a, an additional and exciting addition to this patchwork, uh, and we're excited to be able to uh, talk about it today. So um, we're going to start with what is crowdfunding, what are the platforms, 
how do they work, that, that part of it. So uh, I think I'm going to lean on, on Jeff and Jesse first uh, to maybe kind of walk us through that first part of it. Wh who wants to go first? Well, I'll, I'll just start, but everybody jump in. I mean, I, I think that, you know, the, when, when you think of crowdfunding, Kickstarter is, is sort of the na first name that comes to mind. And, uh, you know, they, they really uh, came through with a, a crazy psychological mix of motivators for behavior change. You know, if, you, if you're a internet behaviorist like I am, you know, you look at like, what, how the hell do you get anybody to do anything in, in the sea of uh, things they can do online? And, and Kickstarter was just really, I think, amazingly brilliant at, at how they devised that whole scheme. And it's kind of counterintuitive. And especially for those of us that have raised money for a long time before Kickstarter, it was like, wow, how, how did they even come up with that? So Kickstarter's one, GoFundMe, Indiegogo, um, those are all similar, um, and I'll, I'll just make one little tweak to one thing Dan said when you said it's a donation-based model. I think it's a contribution-based model, which is slightly different. Donation is, uh, you know, we typically reserve that for tax-deductible nonprofit uh, funding, or at least I do, just to try to keep some organization to the patchwork in my mind. Um, there, there's always new platforms. Um, there are some that people may not be familiar with at all that are actually um, um, kind of interesting um, uh, trailblazers that um, we don't have to talk a lot about, but these are actually uh, uh, benefits of purchasing where you can sign up all your friends to go buy stuff and then rebates are funneled uh, through a nonprofit. Um, there's uh, Ebates, uh, iGive, iMine, uh, which I'm very familiar with if anybody wants to know more later, but. Jesse, you want to fill in? Yeah, um, just to add on, so Kickstarter in particular, you mentioned, you know, what they're doing is so unique with the, you know, the psychology behind it. And so um, some of you may know there's the Indiegogo is another popular one in Kickstarter. And when I was, I was in the post-production phase on Starfish Throwers and we had, just like Dan said, it's a patchwork of all different kinds of funding. Um, and my producer, Melody Gilbert, is like, I think we should really do a Kickstarter. It's the right time to do it. Towards the end, you have a specific goal. You need to pay for your coloring, your sound mix, these things. And I'm like, okay. And I was still a little reluctant, but we were trying to figure out, do we do Indiegogo or we do Kickstarter? Because I had seen filmmakers have success and have not success with both of them. So I started looking at the differences. And it really came down to Kickstarter and that psychological thing about meeting the goal or not. If you don't meet the goal, there is no funding. Nothing happens. You don't get any of the money that's been raised. With Indiegogo, you keep whatever's in there. But the flip side of that is people don't have this drive to keep checking back in and see, did they make their goal? Oh, I got I to gotta get someone else to come and help them meet this goal or, or it's not going to happen. So I had friends and family members that were on you know, our Kickstarter page, I think, more than me, just being like, oh, my God, where is it at? Where is it at? Um, and my, you know, my mom, she was like, I'm going to have a nervous breakdown. I, I can't watch this anymore. It's getting too tense, like, you know, down to the line at the end of our campaign. So I think that's a, a great point to bring up, that there is a kind of a major difference in how these different platforms are structured. And for us, um, I think the Kickstarter piece sort of worked in our advantage. So uh, I think we have... So, so do you want to just talk a little bit about, uh, like, the some of the rules, like, like the fees, for example, and... Should we jump into that? Do we grab questions now or later? So we want to oh, save it for quick. the end. Yeah. I just want to say Indiegogo does have an all-or-nothing model. You can oh, okay. Oh, good to know. Thanks. Okay. So, what are the fees? What What are the fees as in in these situations? Yeah, I I think Kickstarter. It's it's what Kickstarter takes two and a half, and uh, Amazon Payments takes two and a half. Uh, everything's all the actual transaction on Kickstarter is run through Amazon payments and it's sort of a credit card merchant bank fee they tack on there so there's a 5% overhead but that's just the beginning of the overhead of course <laughs> that's the easy tangible quantifiable part uh, then typically people give uh, rewards for the contributions so and those can range from free or next to free to actually quite expensive uh, in terms of actual dollars or time. Um, and then you have to figure in all the time you have to fulfill those rewards, uh, postage, packaging, et cetera. And then, uh, and then you have, um, of course, an incredible amount of labor to set up, 
run, make it successful, nag the contributors, et cetera. So at the end of the day, it, it looks fairly inexpensive and low overhead and like a fast, cheap way to raise money, but I think it is the slowest and most expensive way to raise money. I'll just throw that out there, maybe it's controversial, but it still has an overall wonderful benefit beyond just the money that you raise. And, and is, are there fees that are connected with, if you want to run them through a fiscal sponsorship, is, th is there additional You can't. Fees? No, and at least not with Kickstarter, you can't. Yeah. It's not a nonprofit at all, then yeah. they won't. No, 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 I, but they, they affiliate, I think, with, uh, they'll set you up with, uh, uh, I think Rocket Hub does that, where they set you up with, uh, so that you can, you can channel the donor's gifts through a nonprofit, but there's an extra fee for that, is my understanding. That could be, at least when we did Kickstarter, it was specifically yeah, I don't not think allowed. Kickstarter can do that. Okay. But maybe Rocket Hub. Maybe Rocket Hub. Yeah. Yeah. Which is yeah. a nice thing. We wish Kickstarter could do that because we got that question a lot from backers. Is this a tax deduction? Yeah. Sorry, no. Me. So that's part of the patchwork. You know, we like we had set up our film with IFP to be the fiscal sponsor. So we sort of had our private donor fundraising happen over here before we even did Kickstarter. And someone asked me about that recently. And I think that's a way to do it. You kind of keep that separate out, separated out. Um, and then we did the Kickstarter as a follow-up for you know a lot of people that wanted to come in at the twenty-five, fifty-dollar level. Whereas if they're giving through it to be a tax donation, don't deduction, it's usually a larger number. So yeah, exactly. We did the same thing. We we did equity. We did nonprofit. We did Kickstarter contributions. We did all of them. Um, but uh, yeah, you know, typically a fiscal agent's taking a five percent fee at least as well. So you know that sort of money management overhead is is fairly. Parity, the yeah, return. Yeah. Uh, let's let Zach weigh in here. You, 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 Jeff said, I made a controversial statement about whether crowdfunding is the most expensive, time-consuming uh, way of raising money. Can you uh, fill us in about maybe other ways of raising funds that might be also expensive and time-consuming? Sure. Um, so I will say that any time that you give up equity, uh, in your company, that is the most expensive way. Uh, Just are, give us a, give an, an explanation of what equity is. So equity is, um, rather than receiving a contribution uh, towards your project, you are actually given a share of the profits. And so that's what I'm mainly here to talk about today. And um, But I will say this. Uh, so while my bias is towards the equity crowdfunding space, which we'll go into, um, if you can raise capital on Kickstarter, Indiegogo, any similar site, I say go ahead and do it. That's assuming, of course, that you can't raise the capital from private investors. If you can raise the money from private investors, go ahead and do it. You, you probably wouldn't be here today if that were the case. If it were so easy just to find a handful of angels to raise the capital from one or two or three people, go ahead and do that. That's going to be the least expensive way in terms of the transaction costs and the time and so forth. So to Jeff's point, uh, sure, when you when you have a thousand backers and you offer a t-shirt to each one, there's a handful of time and costs and so forth of sending out those those gifts. And so um, it's, it's, it's nonetheless an excellent way to try to raise capital for a project. So there's no equity given up? You want, to, you want to handle that one? Sure. So um, the way that I look at crowdfunding is there's 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 different spheres. So crowdfunding is a great term, and it truly just means uh, people coming together to support a project. When we get down to the details, it's what type of crowdfunding is it? Uh, Kickstarter is known as a reward-based crowdfunding, meaning I, I give $50, and I get either a T-shirt or a mug or a high-five or access to an app. Uh, maybe I get uh, free beers for a month, et cetera. Um, and so that is to be contrasted with securities-based crowdfunding, um, which is uh, where the, the, the company, the sponsor of the project, is giving up, uh, once again, equity, which is either interest in the project or if, if it could be debt crowdfunding, which is simply, hey, you give someone 5000 bucks. Uh, and in exchange, I'll get an interest rate of 8% per year. So there's, there's many different types of crowdfunding, and the laws surrounding it are very different. In the security space, it's highly regulated, whereas if you are attempting to raise capital on Kickstarter, it's pretty much fair game. Um, 
And so uh, those are sort of the main two spaces that I look at crowdfunding in. And, and if, if you were to do an offering, say a private placement, or <clears throat> what, what, what could a filmmaker expect in terms of fees in order to do it in a way that complies with the law? Okay, and are you talking about the, the old-fashioned way or the new way of trying to raise the, capital? Just the old-fashioned way, which is 90% of okay. the way. Okay, so, so um, for, for quite some time, if I wanted to raise capital, um, I'm going to have to hire an attorney to put together what's known as a PPM, a private placement memorandum, also known as a prospectus. It's a you know thick document. It's going to cost me you know five, ten, fifteen, twenty thousand dollars, depending upon the level of disclosure of information. There are different securities laws surrounding you know how and and where I can go about trying to raise that capital. Um, that's the traditional way of trying to raise capital. It's very antiquated. It's basically built upon the 1933 and 34 acts. It's, um, it's old school. And so fortunately, we're starting to move in the Can direction. Can I just also quickly add that, and then those people that might invest, they, they, they have to be qualified investors. They can't be anybody off the street. They have to, what, make over $200,000 or have a million dollars in the bank. So, you know, it sort of weeds out the average person. Yeah, so, so what Jeff's talking about is something called an accredited investor. And most of you may have heard the term angel investor. Those are basically accredited investors. It's approximately 3% of the population. Annual income of $200,000 uh, per year if you're an individual. For joint couple, it's 300 or net worth of $1 million, excluding the value of your home. Okay, so that's 3% of the population. Since October of 2013, if I have a film and I want to raise capital, I can go online and uh, solicit those folks uh, to invest in my project, and that is perfectly legal. Uh, once again, it's only 3% of the population. So whereas Kickstarter, Indiegogo, et cetera, they own the reward-based crowdfunding track, on the, on the equity-based crowdfunding track, there are sites like... Um, Fundable and WeFunder and Crowdfunder and, and uh, uh, AngelList and Circle Up. Uh, that's just a handful of companies that are in this space. Um, and so it's an excellent opportunity. It's very exciting that now you can go online and you can raise capital from everyone. Uh, this is to be contrasted with the, the old way of doing it where you had to be completely private. You had to be hush hush, hand someone a document, send them an email, you know if you happen to know them. So now you can do it broadly. It's an excellent opportunity now. To I would encourage anyone in the crowd to look at that as an opportunity to try to raise yeah. capital. We just, just clarify, it's not every, you know, you can't raise it from everyone. Once again, it's, it's, it's accredited yeah. only. So. And, that, and this is all US. I, I yep. believe in the yep. UK, you can have equity investment. In, in other, as yeah, yeah, other countries, uh, there are uh, crowdfunding uh, capabilities. And in the U.S., the, there is a crowdfunding law that's been passed, but we'll get into this later, has not been implemented yet because the SEC hasn't finalized the rules. Before we go too far with that... Is this for like an equity event? Yeah, under the, under the crowdfunding that Zach was talking about, which is the, you know, the 506 to accredited investors only, then that's all equity. That's all where you're selling ownership interests in your company. So if it's a corporation, you're selling shares. If it's a limited liability company, you're selling membership interests or units, however they're configured. And the only caveat is that you can also uh, go down that same exact route by selling debt. Uh, so it's also, debt is also considered a security. Um, and once again, rather than being able to participate in the upside, if you're indie film becomes the next Blair Witch, um, I'm capped at that upside if I'm a debt investor. I'm only able to receive whatever the note says, which is typically 6, 8, 10, 12 percent per year. Yeah, well, we're not really going to get into debt in this, in this discussion here. But um, so, so um, we want, we've kind of covered a lot of the advantages of, of crowdfunding, the uh, contributor style crowdfunding, um, you know, that one is that you don't have to, the obligation to pay back, they're untethered funds, they're not, you know, they're not 
you take the money and you can apply it in the way that you want to. Um, it's, uh, I'm going to say, relatively inexpensive compared to equity, uh, depending on how you run your campaign. Um, maybe we can talk about the subjective benefits because you know this is you know uh, a really important part of crowdfunding. So Jesse, maybe you know you could talk a little bit about uh, about yeah. that. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So. You know, when this came out, everyone's like, okay, well, the, the clear benefit is we're going to raise capital so that we can pay for the things that we need to pay for to make this film. But the flip side of that, and probably just as important, is that you're building an audience and a fan base in advance of you finishing the film. Um, and these people are going to be, they, had, they now have ownership in the project, so they're going to become evangelists and tell other people, hey, I, I supported this, I back this, they have skin in the game now, so they're going to go out and help you reach even more people. Um, the other side of that is we were looking at what are the rewards we're going to do, and I remember thinking, ah, I don't really want to do like a, a one dollar award. Is that like is that even worth it? But um, I talked to John Reese, who is a consultant on all these, you know, the new age of marketing and distribution of films, and he, you know, he said something like, "Look, these people are going to pay you a dollar to give you their email." He's like, "Okay, if you look at it that way, like, yeah, you're expanding your mailing list. These are people that you can stay in touch with, not just over the length of this film, but ideally your career as an artist." Um, you're just building and building this list so that you can connect directly with your audience. And if you're not doing the traditional method of distribution, this becomes more and more important. So that's the benefit that, you know, is really like, wow, you don't think about that at first, but that was pretty huge. Yeah, just to tack on, uh, the, you know, if any of you are uh, like Dan and I probably more than some others, you know, back in the day, you know, you, you made your film and you almost didn't want it establish a relationship with the audience because a distributor didn't want you to cement the notion of the film in a way that they might not agree with. And so there was a time when it was almost like a negative to have your own website and your own mailing list and stuff because they're like, well, what if we want to market it as a comedy and you've marketed it as a tragedy? Now you've fucked up our marketing, so don't, sorry, pardon my friend. Uh, so, so we're going to actually pay you less for the movie because you had a website and a mailing list. Now, of course, you know, m you know, part there's this nice handoff, uh, especially if you're going to go DIY and, and self distribution, where I think most filmmakers are making more money now. Anyway, um, th there's just this wonderful handoff to these people that can be your champions, kind of during the development of the film. You get their mail, you get their email address. You know, they, they, they're engaged, they put some money in, and now these become your sort of little mini brand champions that can go spread the word, and it's a, it's a really wonderful handoff. So again, yeah, I, I think, at least in our case, you know, we probably raised about 5% of our budget on uh, crowdfunding, but I think it, it, the marketing value of it has been much, much more. I, I think an, another subjective value is what I'm going to call proof of concept. So, I mean, you're, 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 you, you put together a film, it's, it's all out of your head, you don't know whether there's going to be traction in the marketplace for it or not. Uh, one of the things you can do is, is mount a, a, a crowdfunding campaign um, and, and, and prove to other funders that yes, there is an audience, yes, there are fans, yes, there, there is this concept is going to be accepted in the marketplace. So uh, just for example, um, Eric Stolhansky, who's the current chair of the Minnesota Film and Television Board, uh, is with a group uh, that uh, put out, wrote, and, and starred in uh, Super Troopers 1. So this is a, a broad comedy, um, uh, lots of fun, you know, juvenile humor, they, which they would self-admit, I'm sure. Um, and so th they wanted to do a sequel, Super Troopers 2. And, and they you know, were shopping it around, trying to get it financed. They had written, so they weren't getting anywhere. So finally, um, they, they, they got, a, uh, got some attention to it, but the, the budgets were small. And I'm, I'm not sure all of their motivation, but let me just cut to the chase. They've started a Kickstarter campaign. Uh, they set their, or no, I'm sorry, Indiegogo. They did an Indiegogo campaign. They set their mark at $2 million. So their target was $2 million. That's a lot of dough. But they had a lot of fans. People love this. I, I went to a screening uh, 
outdoor screening. There were people quoting lines as, as the film was being shown. Lots of fans. So they started several weeks ago. Uh, Target, once again, $2 million. They're now at $3.7 million. So now there's only a handful of films like that, right? But it gives you an idea of the power of the crowd to show uh, proof of concept. So. so let's talk a little bit about disadvantages. I mean, what are the disadvantages of, of, of a Kickstarter campaign? What, what do we Poster do? tubes. That's the disadvantage. <laughs> <laughs> okay. that's, that's one of those expenses that you don't think about. You're like, oh, we'll offer posters. It's a great thing. And then you think, well, we don't want to fold the poster. They, they don't, people don't want a folded poster. So then you set about acquiring hundreds of poster tubes <laughs> and, and figuring out what the postage is for those. Um, no, but I in all seriousness, I think, I think it's just uh, estimating the time commitment involved in doing this. Um, and I, for sure, I think everybody underestimates that. Um, and some of the things that we learned is like the sooner that you can get out in front of it and do a lot of work before you launch your campaign, we would do that differently. I don't think we spent enough time um, doing that. Um, but I think that's just the downside is the time commitment. It's it's either going to be time or, or money to, um, to, to get people together. So I think just knowing in advance of all the pre-work leading up to your campaign and then during the campaign, um, what's involved to keep people um, active and engaged, and then afterwards the follow-up of um, making good on all those rewards and sending all that stuff out. Yeah, I, I, it, it's, it's just another really big project to run in the middle of when you're trying to run the real project. And in the old-fashioned kind of equity, you know, fundraising, it, it was a little bit easier to have sort of one or two people just going off and doing that. And even though you had to work with the lawyers and you had to pay money to get your PPM, it, it didn't become such an, a project that, that sort of overlaps so much with the rest of your filmmaking life. Um, I think it sort of stayed in its own box, which is part of, again, why I say the overhead is so high. I think it's, I think for us it became an incredible distraction for our whole filmmaking team that really slowed us down from getting the movie made um, at the same time as it, it allowed us to get money and you know build fans. So it, it, it's, it depends on, yeah. Anybody want to come there? Well, I, you know, we asked the Cohen brothers for a movie once before they became international superstars, and but, but they had still won the con. You know, right, this was maybe after Barton Fink, and they said, uh, "Us give you money? We're all raising money all the time ourselves." So, it, I don't think any filmmaker feels like money is easy to come by. I think that's so, right. <laughs> but all scrambling. I, but l l let's let's riff off of that because I think that's an important point, which is the, 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 when. When Spike Lee did that, and uh, Zac Efron, I mean, there's some well-established, right? There's well-established people who who have done this, and and they did it early on, and did seem to taint it a bit. I mean, why are these guys doing it? They're so well-established, but could, let's talk about what, why would they do that? Independence. So we talk about. You know, that creates independence for them. The, the system is really, you know, the studio system is really uh, a crushing, limiting, creative killing project. Uh, and, you know, but Zach, I mean, you were going to say th something. This is just my opinion on it. I don't see it as a zero-sum game where there's only so much money that can be invested in the film. I see this as a net benefit when you have Spike Lee, Zach Braff, Veronica, Mars, going online, uh, there have been thousands upon thousands of articles generated about those Kickstarter and Indiegogo campaigns. And guess what? More people then know about those websites and are more likely to go on those websites and find other projects. What, what, yeah. what, let me just follow up with you, Zach. Do, do you think this cannibalizes equity? I think that they can work hand in hand. And you know, w uh, the first thing that I wrote down on my uh, 
piece of paper here is patchwork funding because I think that's an excellent point. There is no silver bullet, okay? There's not just one way to find funding. And so you're gonna have to put it together via multiple different ways. If uh, you might have some private investors, you might have to go online and raise some capital on a Kickstarter campaign or on an equity campaign. Uh, if you can seek you know, tax credits, rebates, what have you, nonprofit capital, uh, you're probably gonna have to get very creative uh, to be able to piece it all together. Yeah, I agree. I think it's the more of the merrier. I don't, I don't, I don't mind superstars using Kickstarter. I mean, that's great for them. I don't it think it's a lot of attention to. Yeah, I don't think it distracts anyone from funding. giving fifty bucks to our project. Um, uh, and and yeah, absolutely. I think it w you know our movie Stay Then Go was part of the IFP National Narrative Labs, which is. We were part of 12 under a million dollar uh, narrative movies, kind of learning and sharing and working uh, through things. And I think every single one had at least one crowdfunding campaign, but certainly none were exclusively funded by crowdfunding. So, uh, you know, I think that I think they work together very well. I think uh, you know, to your point too, that. You know, the, even, you know, some of your equity funders that might feel a little bit nervous when you show them, hey, look at the great response we got on Kickstarter. Maybe you want to give a little more now that you've seen it. You know, it's just they work very well together, I think. And, and, and just something that I wanted to add, it's, it's, it's not even a, a battle of these different options being competitive with each other. I, th I think that they can actually work together uh, in a very complex mentory way. Let me just give an example outside of this sector. So we, we do a lot of business with the uh, craft brews that are popping up all throughout town. And so we have a client who raised about $850,000 privately. Okay. And then um, after that round, they went online and raised thirty dollars to $40,000 for uh, something that they wanted to build. Um, that $40,000 wasn't necessary for them to open their doors, but what it did is brought in so many people who hadn't heard of the brand before. So it's almost icing on the cake, cherry on top of the sundae. What, what about the strategy of going the opposite way? Do, I mean, when we, f when we first evaluated crowdfunding, there was a concern that you're gonna let people give you money um, and then you can turn around and ask them to invest in your film later are, are those those are there going to be angel investors who say well i gave i gave you you know five hundred dollars you know so I, i'm i'm done I, I i'm okay if you do you think the strategy i mean i in personal experience i don't think it works that way but is there a strategy do you think you know i i have no opinion on what the on what the order is of how you go about doing it um but you know this is just my own personal bias. I think Kickstarter is incredible, okay? But um, you're gonna find people giving 50, $75. I just don't think it's scalable. Um, because while I'm likely to help out a project and see that it goes through, I'm not going to put down 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, or 5,000 dollars if I have that type of cash to back a project where there's no incentive for me in the end. Certainly there are incentives on the Kickstarter side where, you know, I've seen opportunities where uh, you can be, you can have a cameo role in a film, which I think is a great idea or a speaking line or whatnot. But largely speaking, I think that most projects are going to bump into a ceiling at thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000. Well, if you're trying to raise half of a mill, you're going to have to provide some other incentive. And in my world, that's, that's equity. That's owning you know, a tenth of a percent of the project, and if it gets picked up, if it gets, you know, uh, um, you know, picked up by theaters all across the country, if not the globe, then there's huge upside for me. So that's yeah. where the exciting opportunity is. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think it's a very delicate strategic thing that you have to think through very carefully for each project, because uh, I have seen projects that were like, we raised 100,000 on Kickstarter, and they were super giddy, and, but some of them were, you know, really cornerstone people that maybe could have invested fifty or a hundred thousand dollars themselves, but they kind of got off the hook by putting in a thousand dollars in Kickstarter. Um, so I, I think you can trip yourself up if you aren't careful that way. And it depends, of course, on how much money you have to raise. If all you have to raise is fifty thousand for a run and gun doc, then maybe you know just going Kickstarter all the way is the gr is the best way. But I know we. 
we pushed back our Kickstarter campaign a number of times until we had sort of closed either yeses or noes from people that we thought could give bigger chunks of change because we didn't want that out. Yeah. Jesse? I, I heard this, I've heard the same thing from other filmmakers too. And, and just in terms of the strategy of when the Kickstarter happens, um, you know, I know some filmmakers that have tried unsuccessfully with Kickstarter and it was very early in their project. They were like in pre-production, they'd maybe shot a, a couple things, but it was so early and they just didn't have something really compelling to show. And also people see that as well, will this get finished? There's, there's that risk. So I feel like the later you can come in and say, look, like in our case, we had our, our rough cut done. We knew we needed X amount to license our music roughly uh, for color. And, and when you can put what you're asking and map it directly to be like, we're gonna pay for these things. I think people get, uh, they feel a confidence, like okay, this is clearly, this film is gonna be finished. There's not a risk here. And it's a specific thing that you're raising money for. I think I've seen a lot of other films have success when they're at that final stage. And I've seen films not have success when they do a Kickstarter too early on before they've you know, even started production, so. You know, I think Kickstarter campaigns have been used for all kinds of things. Development money, finishing money. I've seen people use them to go to festival. We, we got into this festival. We need $20,000 to hire a public. I mean, they're used for all kinds of purposes. That creating awareness can happen at the end as well as at the, at, at, at the beginning. Because the awareness is key when, when you get to the marketplace, when you're ready to sell the film. Um, yeah, and that's so the awareness I was speaking about is like when the film gets released, you have people that are on board to help spread the word to, that the film is there to go see it. I don't mean you need awareness at the beginning. You should be doing social media outreach and all that stuff from the very beginning, but the crowdfunding I don't think necessarily has to start right there. We had, we had, uh, there's a question behind you. He had his hand up. I, 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 actually, your opinion came out of your question. It's just like a, a question or a dialogue question. It's like a bit of a disadvantage, though, being this Yeah, I, I mean, I think timing, I mean, we, we did ours in actually in pre-production also. So um, I know a lot of people do it in post. A lot of people, I think conventional wisdom, a lot of people will say you can do it up to twice for a movie, once in pre and once in post. Yeah, And maybe, you know, maybe again once if you, oh, we're going to Berlin and we got no money, we can't afford the plane fare and they're only flying one person. That's a sort of a tack on, I think. But... But I do. I think you can do it in pre. But again, it's even more work in pre, unless you're, unless you're movie making a movie based on a short, um, in which case you can show the short. But you almost have to have a video to show. And so again, a lot of people put a lot of effort into this genre, which is like the Kickstarter video, which isn't. It's not a trailer. It's not anything from production. It's like, and we ended up doing this too. We we shot a whole little two minute short. Which was great, it was very funny. Which Christine wrote, our, our, one of my producing partner actually wrote it and, um, and, and that's a whole genre of its own, which again, if you're a filmmaker, it's fun to make films. Again, if you're trying to actually make your feature, it, it's, an, it's a huge distraction. Well, why don't we start talking about what are the elements? What, what, you know, you, you, just, you just mentioned there's a specific video that you create for your Kickstarter, Indiegogo campaign, whatever it is. Yeah, a lot of people. What, what are the other elements? What I mean. Yeah. So if you if you don't have some footage to show, you got to have some kind of video, and and people often make a, a fundraising video, and those are effective and they do work. They're just a lot of work. Then you need, you have to create at least on Kickstarter. You know, you have to kind of create a whole website. 
you know, you've got to populate it with content and explain your project effectively and concisely. And again, if you've already done that, you, you can harvest materials. For many of us, that's the first time we really confront <laughs> some of those awful realities of how do we actually describe this without making somebody just read the script. Um, then you have to come up with your rewards and you have to, you have to think those through very carefully because they, you know, they can um, you know, create a lot of challenges at the end, but it is also an opportunity to be very creative. Um, you, know, you can come up with anything under the sun. Um, you, have to, um, you do have to um, do some legwork, like with Kickstarter, for example. Like we were totally surprised at how long it took to set up. We had a start date for our campaign just based on assumptions and things we'd heard, and then suddenly it's like, oh shit, it takes like two weeks to, at minimum yeah. to get it through the system because they, they have to approve it. They have to... Uh, they have to verify your Amazon payments account, which takes a couple weeks as well. That's right. You got to give them bank information. You have to fax them stuff. You, you know, there's all these other kind of things. Then they actually give you sometimes feedback on your rewards and they're like, hey, you're, you know, you're kind of given like low value rewards for a lot of money. Maybe that's not going to work. Maybe you want to revise that. Um, so again, and, and, then, and then, then it's the work of actually running it. And I'm sure anybody who's actually run a, you know, you know, one of these kinds we, of yeah, things. Yeah, we keep you, talking about how much work it is. Then you got to, what, 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 what is that gotta work? You just got to freaking what is the beat work? the bushes and nag all your friends and compile everyone on your node, their team, their email lists, and your Facebook page, your social media. You've got to like really put that into hyperdrive. And you gotta, um, you, you just have to do that hard work. It's almost like you're becoming a salesperson. Uh, and then almost, uh, you know, yeah. and and <laughs> everyone you know would be like, oh yeah, yeah, I'll do that. And a week later, you're like, you never did it. Come on, you got to help me out because it's like deadlines coming up. And, and they're like, oh yeah, I'll do that tomorrow. And then they don't do it tomorrow. And then you, you call them again, and you email and email and email and email. And and there is a certain fallout that is one of the other disadvantages. You're gonna piss off about. I think about two to five percent of people that would like you, but are just sick of getting nagged about Kickstarter, uh, and 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 you're going to lose number, a few actually. people <laughs> on the way. Yeah, two to five, huh? <laughs> just, oh, are you pissed off more? <laughs> I don't know. No, I was going to say um, one thing that we didn't do that I wish we would have done and been more strategic about. We did a little bit of this, just again the pre-work before you launch, like identifying. Um, if there are community partners, if there are organizations, nonprofits that are aligned with some of the themes in your film, um, sending them, giving them a look at footage beforehand and being like, hey, if you can be a partner with us, um, X organization, if you could do a, uh, an email blast uh, our, the fourth day of our campaign, get another organization to do an email blast the eighth day of your campaign and like, you know, strategically map this out because traditionally, you see a big, you come out of the gate strong, everyone's feeling good, Day, you know, the first five days, you've got this momentum, um, and then things start to slow down a little bit, and then about midway through your campaign is when it's like tumbleweed, and nobody's paying attention. And then you always get a big boost at the end because of that psychology that people want to see you finish. So I would say, like, in advance, plan to have events or things happening, like, in the middle of the campaign to keep that momentum going. I, I didn't. I, 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 oh, yeah, so right. So um, we didn't actually show a rough cut to funders. I think that would be a great idea to show a rough cut um, to a partner who could help you get the word out. That's one of the things that I, in hindsight, it would have been great to do that, um, especially, you know, dealing with food and hunger. There are some, you know, nonprofits that we could have, could have partnered with sooner uh, that would have been helpful. Um, we didn't, but I think it's a, it's a good idea. What, what about, maybe, Jeff, you can talk about tricks and yeah, tips well, and, was and what, what about second. like pl like planning your you know pre arrangement with donors who are going to come in with a significant bump yeah and and you ask them ahead of time you get them to come in at a certain date in the or in the process yeah definitely i mean the you know, like the executive producer role, uh, you know, can really be an important role to try to take advantage of in this process. So, you know, uh, uh, if you have that kind of a person, which I think probably every movie could or should, um, 
you know, as a, as a financial partner to be, to first of all, see if you can negotiate with them that they'll make up any gap so that they sort of guarantee your goal, um, I think is, gives you a lot of comfort and safety. And again, for most executive producers, if you're not raising a tremendous amount of money, it's not that much money that they can't just go, all right, I'll make it up if, if you get in trouble. So that's a really important thing. Uh, again, yeah, it's sort of staging some people that you know can give a little bit bigger chunk and help show that you've got momentum along the way, you know? So it's like my mom, it's like, okay, mom, wait till week three. I know we're gonna need that little goose, you know, like uh, that, that, that can be very helpful. Um, you know, one thing I would say from a social media perspective, again, you know, there's a lot of social media platforms, but I think Facebook, I think is still, where most of the money is, that's where you've got most of your, you know, uh, middle-aged people that have disposable income. Uh, so, you know, even if you're not a Facebook person yourself, um, find somebody on your team that is that kind of power Facebook person that has two or three or five thousand friends and will will really crank for you. And here's the one super trick that maybe is obvious to everyone, we learned this halfway through our campaign and it made a huge difference, is if, if you actually set up your faith, uh, Kickstarter or Indigo, whatever it is, if you actually call it an event, if you set it up and as an event and the, the day is like the last day of the campaign, then when you invite people to that event, it everything you post on that event page goes into their email inbox unless they have specifically <laughs> declined the event. <laughs> so if they don't do anything, if they don't accept or you know, if they don't pay any attention to the event invite, just everything you put on that page just keeps streaming into their email inbox. And that is a huge difference maker because um, just putting it on social media is not enough. It's a good awareness builder and you will get some things out of it, but unfortunately, email is still a much higher conversion tool, whether it's Kickstarter or selling stuff on target.com, you know, just email is much more effective. So if, you, if you've got a good email list, use the crap out of that. If you got 3,000 people, you know, that your team is connected with on Facebook, use that event trick, because it yeah. will make a big Great. difference. Set up the campaign as an event, but make the make the end date the date of the event. And then f the funny thing is, we had a lot of people that were like, "Yeah, we're coming to the event." It's like, no, no, no. You explain this to you. And then so we did make an event, and it was so fun. Everybody was giddy. We accomplished our goal, and people actually showed up. Yeah, and go ahead. Jesse. And repeat the question. Yeah, uh, in terms of the length of the campaign, you can do different lengths, 30, 45, or, or more days in the campaign. Uh, we chose 30 because the idea of a longer campaign, <laughs> just like we knew what a haul it was going to be. It scared us. And I think Kickstarter actually says, I don't know about the other ones, but Kickstarter says 30 is their highest success rate. Um, if it's longer, things fizzle out, people lose interest. So. Um, at least the case when, when we did ours, that, that was Kickstarter's direct recommendation to keep it to 30. Um, so that's what we did, and that's what, when, when I talk to other filmmakers that have done it, that's what they've done, and, and it seems to be generally recommended. I don't know if, if you have any other thoughts. Yeah, I think shorter is better. We, didn't, we did the 45 day because we were just, we had so many other things going on at the same time. We were just terrified that we couldn't put the focus into it, and, um, but I think it, 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 yeah, 30, I think, is the most effective if you can focus on it. The urgency, it's just on Kickstarter, it's just all about urgency and creating that sense of urgency. Any other tricks that we should el uh, eliminate? Yeah, well, again, and I'll just mention this other trick that most people don't know. Um, it's a very different kind of crowdsourcing, crowdfunding, but... Um, there are several different ways uh, where you can buy stuff online and even buying stuff for your production. Say you all your office supplies, you know, craft service supplies, a lot of food, you know, even, you know, memory cards and things like that where um, you, you, can, you can use these sites to um, essentially get a rebate back and then you can get 
people in your network to become part of your uh, network to sort of um, uh, to exponentially expand that. So, um, you know, if you got to spend some several thousands of dollars, you could be looking at another rebate, which is double dipping on top of other rebates that you might be able to get. And, so. and do we have a name? Are you going to disclose well, the well, name the, of this? Well, the ones, the, I mean, thing? the big one is, is um, uh, well, Ebates is a big one, but they're hard to use. Uh, iGive is one, and iMine is another. And those, but those you do, uh, typically you have to have a nonprofit association to maximize it but not necessarily to get everything out of it. That's my other little secret trick. Okay, <laughs> we're, gonna, we're gonna pivot here for a sec, uh, a little bit here, um, and we're gonna talk a little bit about securities laws, and, and Zach's gonna help us through this. So w we have uh, a, a, the Jobs Act signed into law, uh, April 2012 by President Obama. In there, there's two, Titles. What you mentioned, Title Two, which we I think we've probably covered good enough. That's the accredited investor. Uh, you can now go on the internet and sell and advertise. Um, there's a Title Three, mm -hmm. and um, and then we also want to talk about the Minnesota version of Title Three. Do you want to just walk us through yeah. Title Three yeah. and why we can't use it yet? Absolutely. And there's a Title Four, which just became law, but uh, those are that's exclusively for capital raises that are going to be larger than about five million dollars so won't be talking about that today uh, so title three of the jobs act is truly crowdfunding it's for 100 percent of the population mirrors the same sort of systems that you see in the uk and australia new zealand etc um, it was passed it was a bipartisan bill everyone was super jazzed about it once again signed in april of 2012 apparently at least one person was not jazzed about it. So, uh, Congress directed the SEC to uh, uh, write and enact the regulations surrounding it. And uh, Congress gave the SEC 270 days. Uh, now it's been over 1,000, and the SEC is, you know, it's speculation, but they are intentionally dragging their feet. It's not worth going into the politics of it but they're obviously not comfortable with allowing for true crowdfunding for all, meaning that anyone sitting in this audience could invest $1,000 in a national campaign and buy one share. Whatever that share equals to in the end, that's a different story. So that's not legal today and have no idea when or if that will ever be legal. Um, so pivoting then, uh, Many states in the interim have just been fed up and pissed off and basically said, look, we don't have the luxury to sit here and wait. Uh, we have the advent of the Internet. It's 2015. People want to back companies. I can buy homes with my money. I can buy cars. I can go to the casino and spend it all. I can buy lotto tickets. But I can't back uh, a high-tech company. I can't back a film. I, I can't back any sort of company that I understand. So long story short, uh, yes, question? Just be then an intrastate. Exactly. Thank you. So that's a perfect segue. So what we're talking about here is intrastate securities laws. So each state has the power to draft their own laws, which affect transactions that are solely within the state's borders. What does this mean? It means that the company is located in the state and the investors are located in the state. So to date, there's been about 20 states throughout the country that have said, "All right, SEC." Uh, we're not going to let you stand in our way. We're going to pass our own intrastate equity crowdfunding laws so that any company in this state can raise capital from any resident of this state uh, for an online campaign. Minnesota is trying to become the next state to pass it. So uh, uh, the campaign is called MinVest. Website is mnvest.org. Uh, MinVest is technically a, a, a nonprofit, 501c4. And uh, what we did is a group of us uh, drafted a law uh, that basically creates and outlines this system. There's, there's a handful of different players. Uh, rather than a Kickstarter, we call it a MinVest portal. The MinVest portal can come up with their own name. But the portal has to be authorized by the state to be able to sell the securities. Uh, the real benefit here is that the way that we designed it is that anyone can create a Kickstarter-like platform and they don't have to be what's known as a broker-dealer, like a Piper Jaffrey or an RBC. 
Um, there's different consequences for how they can accept funds, but the long story short is uh, hopefully there will be a competitive playground of different companies that are launching their own platforms. Let's say it's for the film industry. Let's say it's for med tech. It could be geographic based, depending on what segment of the state you're from, uh, to try to raise capital for those companies uh, that serve that industry. So uh, MinVest uh, right now is, we're about on the five yard line and we're very excited. Uh, the bill has been included in what's known as the um, omnibus bills in the House and the Senate for certain committees, the Jobs Committee in the House and the similar committee in the Senate. So we'll hopefully pass over the next few weeks. And unfortunately, the Department of Commerce is standing in our way and uh, said that it's going to take them up until 2016 to be able to write rules. So uh, we're going to try to put as much pressure uh, on the Department of Commerce as possible because um, we, we drafted the law. We spent uh, the past year drafting the law. We vetted it. We've worked with the Chamber of Commerce. We've worked with the High Tech Association, Life Science Alley. I can name a thousand different groups. And can, can you just talk a little bit about the parameters? Like, the, what's the most you can raise? And sure. So the most that a company can raise under the law is $2 million, okay? That is with either audited or uh, reviewed financial statements. Without audited or reviewed statements, you can raise up to $1 million. And um, uh, you can raise that, you can raise those funds from, once again, anyone, be it an accredited investor or a non-accredited investor. An accredited investor can invest as much money as they want in your campaign. A non-accredited investor can only invest up to $10,000. And this is an issue that we are still fighting with the Department of Commerce on, but we feel that it's very important uh, that you shall have the opportunity to invest up to $10,000. Uh, the, the higher number of investors, um, the more challenging it is, the higher costs, et cetera. So, um, and, and is there a, like a min-max like the federal law? So uh, there, there will be a min-max, and um, the purpose of this is also sort of the psychology. You know, once you hit that minimum, the company can break escrow, and they can start to use the funds. The minimum amount that each company can raise will be determined by that company based upon their business plan. They need to tell the prospective investor how much, the bare minimum that they're going to need to be able to execute that plan. Great. Great. Uh, it, and do you still need the, the PPM and all the legal Good question. paperwork yep. that you would otherwise? Yeah, so, and that is sort of the bread and butter of the law, is what do you need to disclose to the investor? And I'm not going to go into that detail right now, but it is very important, and that's sort of the basis for it. There is something that I did want to bring up, and I know that we only have a, you know, so much time left on this panel, but in the interim, there is a way to crowdfund before MinVest becomes law. It's called a SCORE offering, S-C-O-R. It's also an intrastate offering. Rather than uh, MinVest, which is an exemption under the law, you're technically registering your security with the state and you can raise up to a million bucks. And this is legal today. We're doing it right now for a company. It's, um, I'm not gonna say it's the easiest process, but um, if you're trying to raise a substantial amount of capital and you want to be able to raise money from everyone, your friends, your family, and you want to be able to publicize it online, tweet about it, post it on Facebook, LinkedIn, this is the way to do it. So I'm happy to yeah, talk so to it, anyone it about that. It is a public that. offering, but for a startup film company with no operating history, it's really not applicable, right, would you say? I mean, in order, in order to do score, you have to have an operating history and audited and... So right. um, there are certain waivers that you can seek. The, the guidance for the law says that you don't necessarily need an audit if you are a startup company. And so we have certain accounting firms that we work with who will provide a low Good. cost review of the company's non-existent operating uh, costs and so forth. So there is a way to do it for a startup company. Um, uh, the state might look at it differently and might, uh, you know, create the bar a bit higher, but I don't believe that they're going to stand in the way. Okay, so we're going to open it up for questions. We have just a few minutes is left. Is MinVest even active right now? It is not, no. It's, it, it, so it's really not applicable to us right now. That is correct. The score offering is applicable. Uh, 
Um, so I haven't done this type of funding, but Kickstarter was the only th thing that we did, and I, I would do it again. I think it's great for all the reasons that we talked about, but again, just to reinforce that it's part of a much larger patchwork. And for your comment earlier about someone who's just getting started, your first project, like this was my first feature, so I, I specifically put our campaign at the end because I knew I had to show something, so someone with a track record could probably do something in pre-production, but I think for your first project, look into, you know, one of the great things about living in Minnesota, we have these foundations like the Jerome Foundation, uh, the Minnesota State Arts Board. This is how I got the seed money to start production, to fly to India. You know, it's, you know, ten, fifteen thousand $15,000 at a time, but that's going to get a lot, of, a lot of films shot. And then, you know, looking into post-production and be like, okay, now I have something to show. I can go you know, and do that. And then we did have one angel investor as well, so it was a combination of different grants, personally investing in it, um, angel investor, and then crowdfunding at the end. So we brought a lot of those elements together, and I think that's just an important thing to reinforce. Yeah, it's a long haul, and, and again, it used to just be so much easier because you could kind of keep everything behind the scenes and then just un, un, try, start building that brand when it was closer to the time that people could actually buy the content. But now it's a you know, two to five year process typically, so you have to, um, you have to stage it and proceed carefully. I, you know, I don't, I don't know that there's any magic to it except just hard work and, and careful planning and, 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 you know, getting enough help, finding the right interns at the right time and people like that to just kind of keep it going at the, at the right pace. But, um, you know, it, it, it's worth it. It's a lot of work, but it's totally worth it. And just speaking generally about sort of these hybrid models of, of distribution and building your own audience, um, there's a couple blogs that I follow that are really great. Um, Sherry Candler Marketing, she does, she publishes a lot of great articles on the subject. Um, John Reese, who I mentioned earlier, and then the Film Collaborative is sort of a joint venture. You probably know about that yeah. between like Sherry and some other entities, right. but there's great but, tips. But John's really great. I mean, he's, yeah. he's like, he really has defined the space. Yeah, he, and he's quite a character. I, I, I will also refer you to one. Uh, there, there's a doc uh, called uh, Indie Game, the movie. Yeah. Then they, uh, they did a really just, you know, like 10 out of 10 job on all this stuff. And they uh, have a case study that they publish, which is very transparent, where they really kind of tell all. So if you're interested in that um, at all, that goes through crowdfunding and self-distribution and building their brand over time, and it's a, it's a beautiful case study. I'm that was huge. I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah, just, I just yeah. Googled that IndieGamp case study, and it's amazing. It's like a four-part, super in-depth case study. Okay, well, it looks like we answered all the questions. So <laughs> I want to thank Jesse and Zach and Great Jeff. Great panel. And, it was a lot of fun. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you.